So welcome to this panel discussion on fertility preservation in young people with cancer. I am Ushka Koshir and I will be chairing this session. I am myself also involved in some of the work we'll discuss today. I am an early career scientist, mostly working in psychosocial oncology and also an avid patient advocate for Youth Cancer Europe. Today we'll be discussing fertility. Compromised fertility in young people with cancer is one of the most life altering late effects. It affects domains from sexuality to body image, from self-esteem to quality of life. As such, fertility preservation should become an integral part of cancer rehabilitation. Today, I have a group of experts sitting with me and we'll discuss some of the existing fertility preservation practices, guidelines, as well as novel developments and ongoing work in patient advocacy. We'll address the issues with holistic and cross-sectoral approach, discuss some pragmatic, evidence-based, acceptable, scalable solutions that can help reduce us, that can help us reduce fertility and cancer-related inequalities among young people. Before we begin, I'll briefly introduce our speakers. So we have Professor Dr. Anja borgman strout who is a professor and a medical doctor at the University Medical Center Berlin. She has led several impactful publications on fertility preservation services and quality of life. She's among the leading authors working under the umbrella of Pancare Life, a five-year European framework program focusing on fertility preservation guideline development. Next, we have Katie Rizvi. Katie is one of the founders of Youth Cancer Europe, a network of youth cancer organizations to help shape European policy for young people fighting cancer. Her special interest is youth empowerment and enabling survivorship communities. She is also a member of the Patient Advisory Committee of the European Cancer Organization. And between 2015 and 2021, Katie sat on the board of directors of Pancare. And in 2002, she set up the Little People Children's Cancer Charity in Romania that provides daily psychosocial support services for over 300 children as well as young adults in both online and residential programs. Next, we have Dr. Professor Richard Anderson, who is a professor of clinical and reproductive science at the University of Edinburgh and works clinically in infertility and reproductive endocrinology. His interests span women and men's fertility with a focus on oncofertility. Professor Anderson has led and conducted clinical studies developing our understanding of novel neuropeptides in human reproductive function. He was chair of the ESHRA guideline group of fertility preservation and a contributor, contributor to the ESMO guideline on fertility preservation, both published in 2000. He's a member of the ESHRA executive committee and the HFPA scientific and clinical dances advisory committee. And last but not least, we have Max Williamson, who is a graduate entry medical student at the University of Oxford and holds a BSc in Biomedical Sciences at UCL with a first class dissertation on the cell biology of colorectal cancer. He's a patient, patient advocate for Accelerate Fair Trial Working Group and a patient representative for the NCRI Teenage and Young Adult Tumor Research Group. Max advocates for inclusive involvement of patients in health research. He was diagnosed with testicular cancer when he was 15, but has been in remission for seven years. Well, Welcome and thank you all for joining. So we'll open our discussion with Anya, uh, who is working on fertility preservation guidelines. So can you tell us a little bit about how these were developed, um, who are they for, how are they implemented in practice and how regularly are they updated? Yes, thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> in recent years, various guidelines for fertility preservation have been developed. In Germany, we developed a guideline for pediatric cancer patients in 2015, informally consulting leading experts. And in 2017, a formal consensus-based guideline for both adults and pediatric patients followed the participation of various professional societies in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. And these guidelines are revised every five years. And national guidelines from various countries were harmonized internationally within our European network um, PANCARE. And these results were published in 2017 and later. 
So developing guidelines involves careful research of up-to-date literature and interdisciplinary discussions and national laws need to be taken into account. On the other hand, guidelines can also form a base for health politic discussions and strengthen interdisciplinary joint forces. In Germany, fertility preservation is now covered for most patients. But guidelines alone are not enough. As part of our EU-founded project PenCare Life, we implemented patient information material in pediatric oncology centers in Europe. We saw that not only the patients and their parents became better acquainted with the risk and prophylaxic options, but also the treating team. Not only our flyers and brochures proved to be helpful, but also videos. So you can find the flyers, brochures and videos by typing my name, Borgmann Staud, and the term video into Google. <laughs> that are the patient information flyers and brochures. Here you will find information on how to have your fertility checked. For example, you will be asked about regular menstrual bleeding, secondary sexual characteristics such as testicular size, and the hormones FSH and anti-malarian hormone in women and FSH and inhibimb in men will be examined among others. A sperm analysis can also be performed. So if you are a cancer survivor and have questions about this, you definitely should ask your oncologist. About one third of survivors experience fertility problems and more than two thirds after high dose therapy with radiation and alkalins. Unless you have a hereditary cancer, the offspring of cancer patients are just as healthy as the offspring in the general population. And this even after artificial reproductive treatment. When using cryopreserved tissue, however, one must carefully exclude the possibility that there are no malignant cells in the tissue before using it because of the risk of relapse. Overall, pregn pregnancies and birth are normal. However, the radiation of the lower abdomen can result in a smaller uterus that may not nourish the child as well. And treatment with anthracyclines can weaken the heart muscle. Only in these special cases, the pregnancy must be appropriately well managed. Finally, it is important to find experts who are well informed and supportive. For example, via nationwide networks. In the German speaking countries, this network is called Fairty Protect, and here you can find the expert you are needed. Yes. Thank you very much. That was a lot of insightful information, and I've learned as I was just listening to you. Um, now I will turn to Katie. So you have a long track record in working with youth facing cancer and fertility issues. And YC is currently running a project on fertility. So could you speak a little bit about what motivated the project? What are some of the gaps that we're seeing? And perhaps we'll then turn to some preliminary findings. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. So um, working with the PenCare group for more than 10 years now, it was obvious that there was a lot of expertise and a lot of uh, science uh, going into developing the clinical guidelines. And as Anya said, um, sort of the pioneers in Europe where these clinical guidelines were available and the scientific community and also the healthcare professionals were more tuned in to um, the issues of fertility preservation was the German speaking uh, European countries. But Bankair has done a really good job in applying for European funds and more and more projects were created where educating healthcare professionals and also educating uh, cancer survivors became a priority. So the topic was addressed, but this was all for the pediatric oncology community. And this is very important to understand that in this, we also included obviously uh, 
teenagers and, and young adults up until a certain point who were allowed to be treated in pediatric units across Europe. Now, we've met um, lots of young people in Youth Cancer Europe who were either treated in young adult units or in adult units. And they had, they always expressed to us that they had less personalized care and they had less information available to them than some of these um, university centers and research centers that worked within these projects over the last 10 years in the pen care group. So we really wanted to understand um, the amount of information that they received, the amount of knowledge that they themselves had. And of course, because we're talking about a population that uses internet a lot, Googles their own diseases and is already naturally interested in fertility and creating families. Um, we really wanted to understand um, how the question of fertility affected their quality of life and how were they making decisions? How were they able to collaborate uh, and cooperate with medical professionals? So we created this an advocacy project where we are going to communicate about the need for fertility preservation, talking about fertility itself, because shockingly, even the European Beating Cancer Plan has not one word on fertility either fertility preservation or assisted fertility, it just doesn't exist in the context of cancer. Um, but we were also going to look uh, at quality of life and in a part uh, of, the, of the project, mm -hmm. a qualitative um, um, uh, arm of the research, we were going to look at uh, young people's attitudes for creating a family so these were very important broad subjects for us. First of all, we started with looking at legislation. And, and as Anya said, one thing is to have clinical guidelines. Another thing is for national laws to support these. And what we have found, um, our research is not yet uh, completed. So I'm not able to actually give you data and numbers, but I'm, I can already give you some insight into the nuances and uh, that th that we have found. For example, it is now clear to us that heterosexual couples will be receiving more support. But same-sex couples, for example, are excluded from some services. For example, um, sperm or egg or embryo donations might not be accessible for same-sex couples at all whatsoever if they had been affected by cancer. For example, a heterosexual couple may benefit from um, uh, supported services or uh, uh, financially supported, so, so paid by the NHS, by the National Health Support System for, for one or two or a condition number of cycles of artificial infertilization um, if uh, one of the partners has been affected by cancer and are infertile, but it is not true for same-sex couples. So for example, a same-sex uh, female couple will not be able to access this service for the partner that's not affected by cancer and will uh, not be able to either access donation or receive IVF treatment. The same um, uh, problem might also appear for uh, male same-sex couples. And, uh, and, and we know that actually egg donations are even illegal in some countries, might be legal in some other European countries, but might be for a cost. And um, uh, in some countries, uh, frozen embryos might also be given to other parties if they are not used within a certain amount of time uh, without the consent of the cancer patient who might have uh, frozen that egg. So there are a lot of inconsistencies and a lot of 
it, 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 it's a really colorful uh, tapestry when we look at Europe. The, these we, we might think that by having clinical guidelines and understanding about fertility preservation that covers everything, but actually not, because then there is also a question of cost. There's also a question of how long will these uh, be preserved uh, for storage? Will you have to pay after a while or not? And then, and what, in one con, in what kind of conditions are you able to going to use um, uh, the frozen sperm or frozen eggs afterwards? And who is going to be paying for assisted fertility? And who has the right to actually ask for the for national uh, health insurance to cover these? And as we said, there is there is lots of gray areas, lack of legislation, lack of regulation in some countries, and in some countries, what laws do exist are highly uh, discriminating, and our community finds them very offensive and not inclusive. Inclu inclusive. So there are a lot of these questions that we are looking at with our research. So as I said, we're looking into legislation, and then we do have a survey on fertility preservation access, which we wanted to run not with just pediatric cancer survivors, but young adult uh, cancer patients and cancer survivors as well, because that's the population we wanted to look at, look at. And then we will have the qualitative arm, which will really look at attitudes towards creating families and what it means for young people of today. In order for us to be able to later advocate for changes and work with policymakers. We wanted to have a very deep understanding of this huge and complex subject that I've just given a little overview of, and I'm sure there is a lot more details that, that people on this panel can, can share with us. But this was just a few things that we were very passionate to look into with Youth Cancer Europe. Thank you, Katie, for this very nice overview and your project, the YC's project is very comprehensive, looking at issues beyond just those that occur in the clinic, but also the broader psychosocial aspects of fertility that involve person as a whole, their social identities and so on. So it's very important to, to keep those in mind that, uh, like you said, we cannot think of European region as a single region, there really exist significant differences. Um, so now I'll jump back to um, fertility preservation. What are some of the recent developments? And I'll kind of ask you, Richard, to perhaps speak a little bit about that and how some of these differences might uh, be underway to be addressed in clinical settings. Thanks very much. Um, pleasure to be with you and speaking today about this topic. So, so yeah, so where, where are we and where might we, we be going from a more clinical and scientific point of view in this field. Well, um, so, so the, you mentioned that I was chair of the um, European Society for Human Reproduction and Embryology guideline that was published a couple of years ago now. And, and what we'd like to think that that was a really comprehensive view, but it did very much focus on female fertility preservation in adults. Um, so, you know, it did have those limitations, but despite that, it's still a pretty enormous document. And, and to go any further would have really been impossible. Um, and, and I think one of the key things in that that relates to this field is it is a rapidly changing field. And what we wanted to highlight in that document was where the evidence is at the moment, the, where, what people could do that was reliable and robust and safe and effective. Those are sort of the key outcomes that we're looking for. So what should people be doing clinically now that will be of real help to people in this situation? So at the moment, we were very much talking about um, egg freezing, embryo freezing, uh, ovarian tissue freezing, uh, and the developments in that. So wh where might they be going in the future? Well, one area is um, expanding the remit for this and also finding the limitations. So it is increasingly clear that, that age, older age is a key determinant of success. Mm -hmm. But the other end, which is, I guess, what your group is particularly interested in, expanding this into younger patients. And what's happening increasingly in many of the more leading centers around Europe these days is combining different approaches. 
So for example, when uh, ovarian tissue might be removed for that, combining that with isolating nearly mature eggs from within that tissue and allowing them to mature in the lab for a few hours, that's all it takes, and then freezing them as mature eggs. So that patient has two bites of the cherry, so to speak. You have the tissue and you have some eggs without having to go through the more time-consuming traditional ovarian stimulation approach. Now that is still in, in its infancy and not many centers are able to do that because it does involve a complexity of techniques. Um, you know, the, dealing with the tissue, dealing with the eggs, sometimes labs are much more set up for one than the other. And so combining them can be practically a bit of a challenge, but it's clearly a very exciting way forward. Perhaps another way forward that's, that's perhaps a bit more futuristic, but also very exciting, is being able to have better techniques to protect the gonads from the damaging effects of cancer therapy. Um, and there's a, a huge amount of work going on in that, very much in the laboratory environment at the moment. Lots of different approaches being developed, um, which haven't really got into the clinical arena yet. But I think that um, we're seeing such a lot of activity in that field. It won't be long before some of it goes over, crosses over into the fertility preservation field, because then you really are preserving fertility. You're not just freezing stuff. You're actually preserving endogenous fertility. And that would be so much better. You know, and uh, there's always the old saying, an ounce of protection is worth a pound of cure, isn't it? And that's um, always well worth this because it goes back to, you know, with the sort of classical methods of freezing eggs and things, the patient who's using those eggs still has to go back to an IVF center to use them. And it's always been my thought that one of the key advantages of freezing ovarian tissue is that it allows natural conception down the road. And indeed, perhaps slightly more than half the babies that have been born from that have been from natural conception. And to me, that is such a big advantage for our patients, rather than having to go through some more invasive, unpleasant, and indeed expensive um, medical therapies down the road. So protection would be a key way forward. And as I say, we're gonna see advances in that, I'm sure, in clinical trials in, in, the, in the near future. It's been a bit of a mixed field in the past, actually. You'll, you'll be aware that the only real approach that we have at the moment is using GnRH agonist therapy that is really only demonstrated to be of, of value in women with breast cancer. Um, doesn't seem to be effective in other diseases and treatments, and the reasons for that can be perhaps debated, but it's not something that's immediately transferable to all young women with cancer, for example. So we need better approaches to try and deal with that and better trials that show a fertility outcome as well, rather than just, you know, you're still having your periods. That's not actually what these women want. They want to have babies. So there's lots of things that we need to do there. Perhaps, perhaps more futuristically, one of the exciting areas that is still a long way down the road is actually being able to make new eggs and sperm from scratch. And that sounds a bit science fiction, but actually there are labs around the world that are already doing that in animal models, in rats and mice. They can take induced pluripotent stem cells, which you could take from a skin biopsy, you can turn those into eggs within a mini artificial ovary or mini sperm within a mini testis, new sperm within a mini testis, and you can make healthy baby animals from that. Now, potentially, that would allow us to be able to develop these little organoids, as they're called, and actually put them back in patients. And again, you know, making these uh, artificial uh, gametes and going on and using them in the in the lab or in the clinics one thing but to my mind the real success will be when they can be put back in patients and those patients their ovaries their testes will start working again both hormonally and from the point of view of fertility so there's a huge amount of exciting work in, in the years to come to really address this uh, and it's great that there's now i think better appreciation um, I think particularly with on oncology as well as fertility, that this is so important for patients. Um, you know, I think in the last few years, um, the field has been much more accepted by fertility doctors. You know, they're very keen to see these patients make something happen. You know, it's important, it's new. 
oncologists still often are, I think, you know, it's still very much dealing with the primary disease that's going to potentially kill you if you don't get it right, the treatment. That's still the focus. Um, and, and, you know, that is moving, that is changing. The guideline from the European Society of Medical Oncology and equivalent ones in, in the US are really important in bringing this to the fore for oncologists as well. Uh, and, and I'm involved in another group with the American Society, which is again going to highlight that actually oncology trials should be measuring toxicity to fertility. You know, they measure how damaging their drugs are to your heart or your kidneys, but they never mention your ovaries or your testes. They're not interested. They need to be interested in these fields as well. This is what patients want to know. Is it worth taking this course of chemotherapy for a very small percentage of survival, but actually it'll stop me having kids? Well, maybe some people say no thanks. So that is a really important area as well. And, and the, the previous speakers have also highlighted the, the need to get our patients better informed as well. And they're the best advocates, aren't they? You know, it's all very well one doctor persuading another to do, do something, but actually it's far more effective if the patient does so, because then, then you really engender change behavior in, in, the, in the clinical team. And one of the ways we're trying to do that is developing patient decision aids, as they're called. So these are a bit of an advance over classic, you know, you get an information sheet from your doctor and it gives you a bunch of pages of stuff all about your drugs and the side effects. This is more about working out what's really important for you and which bits of this information are relevant for you. That's why they're called decision aids rather than just information sheets. So we have one at the moment, it's, it's available online called Cancer, Fertility and Me, and anyone can find that and go through it. And it is, again, very much orientated towards adult women with cancer. It's not disease specific, it's all cancers. Uh, and so we hope that's useful. And, and it does seem to be because actually just this year it's been loud, uh, downloaded nearly 20,000 times or, or sorry, read 20,000 times across Europe, which is amazing. So to facilitate that, which seems like a real need, we're going to be developing a more young person's version of it, um, more focusing on that. And also we have a project to develop it in other languages as well to include inclusivity. So there'll still be the main Cancer Fertility and Me homepage, but I hope by this time next year, you'll be able to click on a button that'll put it into a different language. You'll be able to click on another button that'll put it into more of a teenage young adult version rather than the adult version. Uh, and maybe specifically more of a male version as well, because it is female orientated at the moment. So there are lots of developments that we hope will help our patients in this regard in the future. Thanks for the opportunity to chat about this. Yeah, thank you very much for, again, this comprehensive view. And I'm excited. I, I share your excitement about the new developments from the very scientific one. I like how you say futuristic. I'm at the moment reading about CRISPR and gene editing. So these things do come about and they evolve. And I think that's encouraging for young patients in particular. And um, a lovely segue into our next speaker uh, with the decision-making aid that you said, it's very important to include patients. So with that, I will turn to Max. Uh, you're a patient and a patient advocate and also a medical doctor in training. Can you speak a bit about your experience? What worked well? What could have been improved? Sure. Sure. Um, so um, I had, testicular cancer when I was 15, um, which brought with it a lot of challenges in particular to do with my fertility. And it was always something that was on my mind even before I had the diagnosis actually. Um, so I, I think I was relatively lucky um, in that I had, um, I was offered fertility preservation in the form of sperm banking um, very early on, prior to my first surgery actually. Um, and that isn't, or at least at the time, because this was 2013, that wasn't necessarily the, the, the norm across the UK at the time. And it's becoming much more prevalent now, which is great. Um, but it wasn't, I was, I was actually aware of myself and I was thinking about, not in terms of I, I need to bank sperm, for example, but it was something that was, I was concerned about certainly when I had my diagnosis. Will I be able to have kids on my own in the future? And so when they offered it, I was really thankful. Um, with that said, it was a very difficult experience, I think, um, especially at that age. 
um, there's no easy way to actually have those kinds of conversations. I think it's just something that we have to recognise. It's not an easy thing to talk about when you're a teenager and experiencing puberty and having to worry about things that you really shouldn't have to be worrying about at that age. Um, so whilst it was all explained to me very well, the actual process in itself was was tricky. Um, and, you know, so for example, I had the conversation about sperm banking with my parents in the room. Um, and I'm not certain looking back on it, whether that was the right, the right call, um, because it obviously was quite uncomfortable <laughs> to talk through all this stuff um, and in a quite kind of quite clear, maybe blunt language as well, um, about what the process was going to be and, and things like that. Um, it wasn't a particularly uh, comfortable place anyway in and of itself. Um, and I was surrounded, uh, there were a couple other folks in there who were at least double my age and it definitely along with everything else made the whole experience very emotionally quite difficult in, in ways to which to be honest I'm only now really just unpacking um, and I think at the time and this is something that is a general theme especially for young people with cancer is that you put up a shell and emotionally you don't allow yourself to confront the things that you're facing um, and certainly when at the time I was very stoic and said that I was quite happy to do it but actually if I'd had the the emotional space to be able to say to pause or to ask different you know, questions I would have um, but you, are, you do feel pressured into these things in a way so um, I guess in terms of my own experience um, the most important takeaways for good practice in this area with regards to young men is making sure that there's plenty of time as much time as possible naturally there's sometimes when things have to be rushed because the patient is unwell but you have to ensure that the young person is comfortable in what they're signing up to and that they're fully aware and informed before signing yes that consent form um, and then also getting to know your patient a little bit at least beforehand um, because that will allow you to then know whether for them the right thing is for their parents for example to be in a room or not it will allow you to know how to explain it in a way that's comfortable for them and allows you to develop a bit of, of kind of flexibility with regards to the kind of emotional and psychological aspects of fertility preservation that can come with a cancer diagnosis. Um, so I guess time is the most important thing for me in terms of making sure that it's done well and communicated properly. Thank you for all these insightful comments. Uh, I have a few general discussion questions for the next 10 minutes or so. Um, and then if we have some time remaining, I have a few general questions we have received from patients involved with YCE. Some of them will have been addressed already through your comments. We discussed some of the excitement, uh, exciting developments, um, but also identified some pitfalls. So what would be some concrete steps, next steps we can take in science, in industry, in healthcare settings and in patient groups? I was uh, just um, uh, wanted to point out that uh, what my colleague said that the development of the possibilities, for example, not only the tissue cryopreservation, but also to separate, uh, to make a separate protocol where you um, freeze the the eggs separate from the tissue. I think this is a very important technique which really would help uh, so much if this could be uh, done in many centers. It's not in Germany, it's not uh, um, common to do this, but I think it would be very, very helpful because then we can uh, preserve the issue and the eggs and don't have the risk to induce a relapse uh, when going back to the tissue. So I think this I, would be my wish <laughs> for the future. <laughs> And if I Thank may you. comment yeah. on that, actually, uh, sorry, Anya, like I, I was actually going to be commenting on the same subject, but maybe from, from a different point of view, that during our qualitative uh, research and our interviews, actually, we've come across many different patient stories that really shared very um, deeply um, their emotional journeys. And one of the outstanding um, and kind of recurring thoughts that, that were shared with us, which really stood out for us, was that for patients who, that there was especially one particular patient who, who, who 
chose and was able to, to discuss it with their healthcare provider that they will save her uterus. And she has frozen eggs. And this was a, a, a real uphill bot battle to begin with, to be able to have this conversation. But she was a very well-versed, well-educated uh, patient. But then um, at the time when she was able, she, she, she was in remission, she was able to uh, make a decision with her partner to um, unfreeze the eggs and go through the uh, uh, the uh, artificial fertility, uh, fertility treatment, uh, all her eggs were destroyed. And what was very insightful for us, which we were not aware of before, we heard her story and some other stories as well, is the emotional impact. She said that she was facing cancer, um, with a different mind of frame, a different uh, frame of mind, always hopeful. There was always this future that she was looking forward to with her partner and having a family. And then for her culturally and, and in every other way, it was a very important thing to be able to have a family with that partner. And when her eggs were destroyed, she said that the mental health effect of that trauma was bigger than facing cancer because there was hopefulness before and then all of those plans were destroyed with one news that she received uh, from, from the clinic when she was called about this news. So I think uh, it's really, really important to always bring patients and the patient's stories into these conversations and into these discussions. And as you asked, Orshka, like what would be some next steps? And absolutely advocating and speaking with policymakers and lawmakers is so, 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 so incredibly important because um, it's not just a clinical um, setting and, and the clinical guidelines and the clinical decisions that we need to discuss, but the way it affects the human beings and the whole person. And I think you will, you also have found some things in the survey that we have done, Urshka, that really shed light on how quality of life is really genuinely affected. And we can show it this way, data, um, depending on whether your fertility is discussed or addressed or not, or whether you are able to make a family after cancer treatment or not. But I think maybe you can share some details about this. I know some of the results are in already. Yeah, thank you for um, this opportunity, Katie. So just to jump in uh, with some results, preliminary results, really. Since February, we have surveyed over 600 young uh, adults or adolescents and young adults um, with cancer across wider European region and we really see some differences while majority is informed about uh, and discusses fertility at the clinic about 28 percent do not report having had the opportunity to do so and interestingly when we control for the country region so we clustered some countries based on some previous um, reports how to best group uh, different healthcare systems. We really see that the Eastern European countries res uh, report the lowest rates of uh, involvement in fertility discussions, perhaps not surprising, uh, but that's where we need to really emphasize it's important to advocate and continue to expand these services that are exciting and novel. And uh, furthermore, when we look at more closely, it's really those who, like Katie suggested, those who have not had the opportunity to discuss fertility with their healthcare providers that report lower quality of life. And they also mentioned that fertility related concerns greatly impact their levels of anxiety uh, and depression. So that's all important to keep in mind, the mental health aspect. Um, As you say, like the most important part in a way is actually that, that period in between the process of banking and the process of having a child, hopefully, um, if, if that person would like one. And um, it's kind of, it's interesting because I often worry about this, you know, what happens if my, what happens if there's like a fire in the bank or something like that? And then like, you know, um, actually, there's quite a lot of psychological kind of 
wear and tear maybe that goes on in the background um, because you do rely on this thing uh, in a way for a lot of the kind of um, reassurance um, in terms of kind of dealing with the difficulties like those kind of traumas I guess of, of cancer therapy um, and then also having a that kind of period in, in the lead up to um, a pregnancy um, where you're not sure, quite sure if it's going to work or what, you know, what happens if it doesn't. And that can happen for any number of reasons way beyond the fertility preservation service itself. So yeah, recognizing that there's a much longer and much higher stakes kind of process in the whole of the fertility kind of, I hate this word, but journey, I guess, um, is, really essential in terms of thinking about the long-term treatment of patients and it'd be really nice to be able to see some kind of contactable psych psychological slash psychosexual service that allows young people to process this properly over a period of time um, recognizing at least myself that a huge amount of the kind of work of getting over the whole treatment period has been in the last couple of years when i'm much older than i was when i was actually being treated um, and I feel very differently about it now than I did then. So, yeah, I think making sure that fertility preservation doesn't, doesn't just stop at banking um, and actually is a longer, longer process. Thank you. That's a very important addendum. I thought that would be neat to jump to that's related. So we, we are mentioning managing expectations. It's important to, for patients to know the risks and perhaps one of the most common questions we hear um, is patients know they are having a hard time understanding how do they know if they're fertile? Is there a way to quantify in percentage? Uh, I also have some experience in statistics and science. I know it's really difficult to talk about risk, uh, odds ratios and so on. So, but this question that is really bothering them is how can I know if I'm fertile or not afterwards? What's the actual risk? And um, secondly related, will I pass cancer on to children? Should I just not bother having a family? Um, that's really the two major concerns. And I, I thought I would use that time um, to address it to the two uh, experts we have. But I should chip it on that last point then, Oscar. That's very interesting. That, yeah, I, it it is a challenge, isn't it? And I think I think it's 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 actually um, perhaps even more complicated than that because I I get referred quite a lot of particularly young men who are cancer survivors from our pediatric endocrinology service with the question is is this young man fertile or not? And 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 of course the the obvious way to do that is by doing a semen analysis, and actually we find that many of them don't come to these appointments, they don't want to know. And I think that it raises the question of, you know, as a young person, knowing that adds, uh, for a certainty, adds a significant burden to your life. Whereas if you don't know, and just as no 19 year old knows that they're fertile or not really, um, but knowing that you're definitely not, adds a complexity to their further life choices, new relationships, and so I can quite understand that many of these people will would would rather just not know at the time and, and actually then want to find out when they're in a relationship and when they're trying to achieve a pregnancy, then it becomes important and you need to know. So I, th I think there's there's a, there's a lot of a lot of issues here in terms of testing. Well, there are tests that can be done, of course, both for, for males looking at semen analysis, but. Oh, and for women talking about whether they're ovulating particularly or you highlighted perhaps damage to the uterus as, as another thing. And, and there are various degrees of accuracy of these tests, um, but, there, but it's very difficult unless you find that someone, you know, unless it's a very obvious absolute, you know, there are no sperm or there are no eggs, no one, you're not ovulating. Then you can be fairly clear that someone isn't fertile. But if there is, then it's much more uncertain. And I'm, you know, every doctor who works in fertility will have seen couples where you thought, gosh, that really isn't going to work out. And then it does. Well, in my opinion, so, I think it is a good idea to pro be proactive because it could be that at one point a, a woman is still fertile. But if you wait too long, then uh, she has 
uh, experience or could experience premenopausal, um, uh, yeah, pre um, premature menopause. So I think it's always important with all the um, aftercare appointments you have with the adolescents, just to talk about it, just to talk about, do you have any questions? Do you want us to check something? And just to go with the patient and to talk, because I think some patients or parents, until they are 18, they come with their parents, they have these questions, maybe they are a bit shy, but maybe these questions are important. So I think it's always important to talk about it and if they want to check it. Show you. And this yeah. is why I think it's very important that mental health professionals are always involved in this process throughout. And this is something that our patient advocates are always mentioning and always bringing up, even in clinical research groups so that uh, there is a continuous awareness that rather than shying away from giving information or giving choice, support the patient with mental health professionals, please, and with navigators who are able to, who are able to help them rather than making a, a decision on their behalf that they are not able to handle it. And I, another thing I think that's very important that you also mentioned, Anya, that you know, there, is a, there is a window and that uh, we, we, what we want to we want to avoid is regrets later on. And unfortunately, the generation of young patient advocates who are today cancer survivors might not have had that opportunity and are full of frustrations and what we would like to do, what we would like to make sure that it's not going to be like that in the future. And one of the reasons why. We are connecting our research project with advocacy and the and and the importance and actually the most important outcome of what we would like to do with Youth Cancer Europe is 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 uh, uh, policy work and uh, lobbying for better better laws and better regulations is because we want to change things for the future for 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 future cancer patients. That's very important. And I think so. One of the things that you highlight there as well and i think it very much harks to what to what the important things that annie was just saying as well is that often these sort of more detailed fertility related uh, discussions are difficult for oncologists because it's not their field uh, and and you know likewise i wouldn't dream of discussing the the ins and outs of chemotherapy with the patients um you know the patient needs to get the right information from the right person to really for it to be accurate and so we need good, easy communication and swapping back and forth, you know, for patient oncologists to be able to say, oh, go and see Dr. X just for a, a chat about your fertility. I'll be carrying on looking after you, but, you know, good multi-way discussions and sharing of information. Exactly. We wholeheartedly uh, support this. And uh, we think that is, this, this is extremely important. And you said something earlier that we want to make sure that uh, fertility is included in clinical trials as well, because mm. Currently, it is an afterthought. And yeah. what we also notice that that across Europe, except in some clinical centers and university centers, uh, offering uh, uh, fertility consultation in the, in the oncology setting is also an afterthought. So not just in the in the clinical trials, but in uh, care settings, yeah. it's still just an afterthought. And, uh, and as we said, the Beating Cancer Plan has absolutely no mention of fertility. It doesn't, doesn't uh, equate is anything. It's not connected when even when we are talking about quality of survivorship or uh, quality of life. Uh, fertility is not mentioned as an important aspect. So there are things that we can change. And I think by talking about it and having uh, discussions like this and speaking on conferences and doing a lot of advocacy, at least we will start uh, changing the, um, the dialogue on the subject. That's, that's so disappointing that fertility isn't mentioned at all anywhere there, is it? That's It's yeah. really... You know, it's it's a really, um, you know, historic viewpoint, I think. And yes. I think one of the things I'm really pleased that we're now entering these conversations with with ASCO, the American Society of Clinical mm -hmm. Oncology, is if they put out a document saying this should be done and perhaps even uh, drug trial regulators will pick that up and say, actually, you know, you, we're not going to interested in regular in approving your drug because you don't know this bit about it. Mm -hmm. You might know it doesn't damage kidneys, but you don't know what it does to ovaries. Go away and find that out and then come back and we'll talk about regulating and approving your drug. 
Yeah. You see, yeah. yeah, I very much agree and I appreciate all these comments because from our quick results, we also see the majority of patients still hears about fertility from oncologists first. So um, yeah, it's important that as we're becoming ever more personalized and targeted in our approaches, we also need to make sure that we have the right people discussing these uh, specific issues. And perhaps here, I'll then also give a chance to Max to chip in on the but communication you aspect. So, so you have gone through the experience, so you have your own, but you also work in patient advocacy. So inevitably, you know other stories and you have this other role of a doctor in training. Um, so communication in decision-making related to fertility is very important. What do you think should be some of the, the steps we should be taking? Uh, who should be communicating what? Um, what are some of the things you are hearing from patients? Um, what are you advocating for? And what do you think are best practices? Um, so <laughs> a few different questions there, but I think uh, there'll be, yeah, I, I think the most important thing is trying to maximize the patient's autonomy in that situation um, and giving them as much room and flexibility as you can as a healthcare professional um, to allow them to make their own decisions and feel empowered in the process. Um, I know, I mean, I, I know it's the case that a lot of, well, not a lot of, like a few other patient advocates I've met didn't really want to take part in fertility preservation, but they knew they should in a way because they thought it was the right thing to do. Their parents might have told them that it's the, the right thing to do, but actually in their heart of hearts in that moment weren't particularly keen on the idea, not on, not unreasonably. Um, and so I think it is about making sure that you, you clarify in your mind that you know that the young person is happy to do this um, because feeling pressured in that kind of situation adds a lot of emotional baggage. Um, one of the things that I've been working with Richard on actually is as an advocate is um, this fertility um, preservation decision aid for young young men and boys um, who are facing having to um, kind of use fertility preservation methods. And it might not necessarily be for cancer, actually it could be for any patient who's um, going to be treated with kind of toxic chemotherapy, for example, so sickle cell patients who might be receiving a bone marrow transplant, for example. And um, it's a really, really useful tool. I'm really glad to be working with Richard on it, but it's allowing us to create a kind of stratified method of um, ensuring that we actually do represent the views of young people properly. Um, it's interesting as part of that application. And as you say, I'm, I'm kind of in, in three worlds in some ways across this whole thing in that I'm a patient. I'm also a medical student trying to learn the medicine of it. And I'm also a researcher in a way, and I'm trying to help with a systematic review that we're using to put the grant together. And reviewing all the literature, there is almost nothing. And my, my focus is on um, the kind of aspects of qualitative and quantitative research on fertility preservation for those who are under 18 and that probably understandably there is there is almost nothing out there actually in comparison to the older age groups um about how to do this properly and i think it's it's a recognition of how difficult it is and how difficult it is to do well um but the things the key themes that are coming out of that for me are things like making sure that um you're trying to ensure something is kind of um level throughout geography that's one of the key issues a lot of the papers are from america but they're also relevant in the uk and that some people have access to these treatments through trust funding for example within their local hospital region and other people won't have access to it and i think one of the key things we need to recognize recognize is that this treatment should be fair across geography um and i, I don't know i don't know about the situation in europe as such but i know certainly in the us and the uk it's a very patchy patchy thing um, and it's also about making sure that, as I say, we tailor it towards the young person. It might not, the, the right method might not necessarily be sperm banking. Maybe it is for the older teenagers and for the, for the older adults, but actually there are new methods like um, uh, electro, uh, electrified preservation and things that allow us to um, extract sperm and things in a way that might be more comfortable for that patient um, and are, uh, you know, might, might therefore be the right thing to do. It's important to educate ourselves about what these other methods might be and um, to allow that young person to make an informed decision about what the best option is for them. Obviously, well, we're slowly running out of time, so I will 
I would like to thank you for this very insightful discussion. As we have heard, there are existing evidence-based guidelines for fertility preservation in youth with cancer. However, differences do exist in implementation and especially availability. Fertility preservation can be treated, should be treated as a biopsychosocial phenomenon. And as such, going forward, it is imperative that various stakeholders and policymakers are engaged in order to provide the necessary services and infrastructure. At YCE, some recently collected data, as we mentioned, uh, suggests that patients still struggle with receiving adequate services, especially if they're coming from more Eastern Europe. Um, so no matter what, in research, in clinics, in policy events, patients' voices need to be heard. With that, I would like to thank our speakers and experts and We'll see you live next time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, Thank you. I think this is pretty much it.